Shalom Chavim. It is so good to be back with you. I am doing a series of videos uh, in regards to a, a, a precious Jewish uh, brother who has been watching my videos. And he has had a desire to try to steer me in the right direction, uh, believing that uh, considering the fact that uh, Jesus could be Moshiach ben David would be an era, uh, and a grave era, in fact. And this brother, in very much love, very much concern, uh, sent me a series, a series of videos from Rabbi uh, Yosef Mizrahi, uh, and who uh, Rabbi Yosef happened, he's the uh, head rabbi for uh, Beit Galvriel, I believe that is in New York. And it was a debate, uh, you could find the debate on divineinformation.com, which is Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi, his website. Um, and the debate, I don't know the man's last name. His name is Danny, is his first name. He's a teacher from the New York School of the Bible in Manhattan, Mid Midtown Manhattan, who came out to try to defend Christianity as uh, Judaism versus Christianity is kind of the title of the debate there. Um, if you were to watch it and you're a Christian, I will tell you one thing. You need to wear a seatbelt when you watch it because you have to understand Jewish people are very knowledgeable. Uh, the rabbis know, many of them that have studied anything about the Christian Bible know it very well. And unfortunately, a lot of times from the standpoint of a rabbi, the study of the Christian Bible is not so much a study to see if there is truth in there, but you have to understand, if the rabbis feel like the congregation is being um, uh, proselyted by Christians, they are there to defend their flocks. So therefore, they're trying to get a better understanding on the Christian Bible and what's written in there. So therefore, they read it from, from the standpoint uh, of a critical mind. And so therefore, if they see what is perceived to be contradictions written in the Christian Bible, that's exactly the way they're going to take them. And so Rabbi Yosef, he begins the debate off. Uh, it's a very lengthy debate, so I'm going to do this video in parts, trying to take each one of the questions that he brings up to Danny, uh, who's trying to defend Christianity. Uh, in many cases, he was unable to answer Rabbi Yosef, but I believe by the grace of Hashem, I, could, I can answer these, these things here. So if you do take the time to watch it, be very careful what you're watching, because uh, unless you're a solid Christian, it would probably stumble you as a Christian as well, because Rabbi Yosef makes a very powerful argument. Interesting enough, though, uh, Rabbi Yosef does say in, at the beginning of the video, unless these uh, supposed contradictions, I would call them, could be, uh, if there could be a reasonable answer to them. But he does make the stand that the Torah, Christian, Christianity agrees that the Torah has no errors. But that saying, let me say this, though, and, and Rabbi Yosef, a, a, a wonderful rabbi from what I've watched uh, his videos and stuff he's a, he's, a, he's a precious man of God he is my brother by flesh we are we are definitely cousins no matter how no matter how far that has come down through the, through the, through the nation of Israel we're still uh, distant cousins we still come from Abraham our father and uh, I am Jewish both by my mother and my father my father though his family had, had been in Christianity for many years uh, my mother, though, they, they were Jews all the way down. Won't get into that issue, though, here. But at any, at any rate, what I want to, to bring to, to your attention, though, is the different aspects of the debate uh, and try to answer these in a more logical way that would defend uh, not these to be contradictions, but yet, but yet they, can be, they can be proven. You can actually understand and see this a little bit better. So... Each video may be a little bit lengthy, so pardon me as I go through this. I want to take the time because this is for the sake of my uh, rabbinical brethren, my, my Jewish brothers and sisters as well, any of those that happen to watch these videos. Um, you know, we're, we're going to start off with probably the strongest thing that Judaism looks at in Christianity, and that's the genealogy of Jesus. Now, when Rabbi Yosef begins the argument with Danny on the genealogy of Jesus, he starts off by saying this here. One, Moshiach is, be, is to be the son of David. Moshiach ben David, in Hebrew we would say. And if Jesus is Moshiach ben David, he's, he begins the debate by the fact that the Christian Bible uh, shows that Mary comes to Yosef, her husband Joseph, and says to him, I've gotten a child from the Lord. Now, 
Rabbi Yosef is going to make the argument here with Danny here that uh, that she did this to save face because, of course, back then, you know, it was punishable by death for a woman to be found with a man or a child from another man. And truly, this was uh, the law of Moses. Um, so he's going to start that. And he says, before we even get into the fact that then how could it be the son of David, if, if, if we have this problem here that it's not even Joseph's son, how's it going to be? Uh, of course, Christians generally have a good answer for that, but I'm going to give you one much better than most of you ever thought of. Uh, but we'll get past that. But really what he goes into next, though, before you could even answer that, you're going to have to deal with the fact that Matthew and Luke give two separate genealogies for Jesus. And this poses the first question. And Danny was totally unprepared for this question to be asked. Uh, I kind of am aware of it because I know that's one of the major things that Jews go for when we're dealing with uh, the, the Christianity is that the Christian Bible must have 25 mistakes in it. And if it's got 25 mistakes just in the Gospels that are recorded, then how can we trust it? How can we believe it? Um, another thing I kind of noticed before I actually begin to address this here, let me just say there's something that's kind of interesting when I was listening to um, Rabbi Yosef in this debate. There seems to be an indication that um, that the canon of the Bible, uh, or, or let me say it like this here, Yo Yosef, Rabbi Yosef, uh, uh, refers to quite a bit the words of Jesus when Jesus says not to add one milah, milah is a word, it's Hebrew for the word, word one milah to the Torah. And he's quoting it, and he even makes a very interesting observation. He said that the the, the, the followers of Jesus in his day were far better than the ones today. I agree with that as well. He also pointed out the fact, he said, what Christians, what among you are, they keep Shabbat and keep uh, uh, the Sabbath, uh, uh, excuse me, Shabbat is Sabbath, and, and they also keep kosher. And, of course, you don't find that very often in Christianity. Generally, you would find that amongst what they call messianic believers, which the Jews are pretty hard on the messianic believers as well. Um, that would be a totally different discussion altogether. But for my Jewish brethren that watch this video, I do keep Shabbat and I do keep kosher as well. So you do have one that believes Moshiach ben David to be Yeshua and that does still keep these traditions. So I'm trying to be a better follower uh, like the early days were. And But what I was wanting to get at though is when he speaks about not to add one word, I don't think that Rabbi Yosef would be against the canons of the Christian Bible if he felt that there were no contradictions. And the reason I say that is because when we begin to look at the Kotavim, Venavim, which are the writings and the prophets, such as Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the writings would be like uh, David and the Psalms and Solomon, the Proverbs, uh, as you would say in English, and, um, uh, and like I said, the prophets being like uh, Zechariah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, these being the prophets. Now, we know that when Moses says not to add one milah to the, to the law, one word could not be added to the law, and to do so, or to diminish one word or letter, it would be punishable by death. Now, no doubt, as Jews, we even understand that the, that the Navim, the, the prophets, and the Kotavim the, the, that have been canon to the Bible are not taking away or adding to. So no doubt Moses was not talking about this, or that could not have been made part of what we call the Tanakh, the Bible, the Jewish Bible. But my question would also have to stem, and I want my, my rabbinical brethren that watch this video to keep this in mind. How could we say then, what makes us say that we stop with Malachi, Malachi, the prophet Malachi, as being the last canon to the Tanakh? Because... If truly the Christian Bible can be proven not to be contradictory of the Torah, and it is written by Jewish prophets and, and Jewish apostles, are, 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 are the, are, you know, it, would be, it would be the same, Kotavim Navim. It would be more of the, of the writings and the prophets. Then if it's not in contradiction, it could be canonized with it because it's Jewish, all Jewish writers. The prophet would be John because he does prophetical things. Now, there are arguments that Yosef uh, argues that, uh, that uh, there were no prophecies uh, or that uh, one, th one thought real quick before we get into this genealogy that kind of really got me here. And I didn't know where Rabbi Yosef was coming from, but he makes mention that Jesus was against or, 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 or prophesied that Israel would not return 
as a nation, and yet they're back as a nation. I don't know of any prophecy that Jesus has ever done, and I do challenge my brethren to point this out to me. I'm assuming that you would be maybe considering the, the writings where Jesus weeps over Jerusalem and says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. Your house is left unto you desolate until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. If that is the one you're referring to, it did not ever say that Israel would not be gathered again. Totally to the contrary. He's showing that Israel will be gathered again, but at a specific season. Uh, uh, he also, um, uh, he speaks of the fig tree when it puts forth its branches and its bud. Know that even summer is nigh. And, and of course, the fig tree we know refers to Israel. So Jesus is there prophesying that when the time would come in the last days that the fig tree would put forth their buds, showing that Israel would be a nation. So he is prophesying that Israel will be a nation again, as well as Paul in the book of Romans uh, is, is also showing that Israel would become a nation again. So the theme in, in Christianity is not to say the, Jew, uh, the Jewish people would not return, but in fact they would return. So I would kind of uh, have to uh, differ with that particular uh, uh, assumption on there. Now, let's go though back now. Um, when we say, when Rabbi Yosef points out that the Christian people agree that the Torah has no mistakes, I agree with him 100%. Uh, the Christians do believe that. And so therefore, how could we have mistakes in the Christian Bible? So, but he give the room for it unless there's a reasonable explanation. Now, to my rabbinical brethren that watch this, how we look at the Christian Bible, if we're not looking at it to look for truth, we're looking at it to look for, for fault to begin with. So we have to be just in our cause. How many of us, if you're a rabbi uh, and you're going to, you're trying to protect your flock from, from, from Christians that are out there proselyting, how are you going to protect your flock but to go to their book and look for fault? You're not looking for, we're not looking for answers, we're not looking for truth, we're looking for fault to try to get our people not to go in that direction. Okay, so it's no different then with the critics, and you can go on the internet and find out real quick, why don't you type into the internet, and I've done this before just to see out of curiosity, um, uh, mistakes in the Tanakh or the Torah. And there is a huge list. Uh, for example, they ask the question, you know, in, in, in Genesis 1, Adam is created before plant life, and Genesis 2, he's created after plant life. Uh, you know, these are some of the arguments that our skeptics that don't believe the Torah argue, and of course they have a long list of them. Now, if we're given the opportunity to be able to explain those, we know the reasonable answer to these, to these issues, and we can explain that. But from the critic side that doesn't believe in Judaism to begin with, and they don't believe in Moses, uh, they're just out there to condemn and criticize, they're going to take the opposite way. All right, so we got we to be fair in that regard there. Are we looking at the Christian Bible just from contra for, for the contradiction's sake, to be able to stem any, any movement of Jews into Christianity? And of course, there's not a lot of Jews that, that accept this, this belief in the first place. Um, but... Uh, so therefore, I argue, let's take the time to examine the questions, you know, that my, my brother here, Rabbi Yosef, puts forth. And, and, and keep in mind, too, uh, to my rabbinical brethren, many of you would say, well, if, he's, if he believes that Jesus is Messiah, he can't be Jewish. That's as furthest from the law of Moses as you could possibly get. Th it's not the teaching of Moses. And you know it's not the teaching of Moses. Because you have to remember, how many... I can name you a dozen of, of, of men that down through our ages of our, the history of, of Judaism uh, that we have considered to be, uh, or not every Jew believed it, but many Jews would say so-and-so happens to be uh, Messiah. And the man would die and they would expect him to come back someday. Many, many times, even into contemporary times in Israel, you know, even Rabbi Kaduri, you know, some have thought maybe he was Moshiach, you know, but the thing is, because the Jewish brethren believe these different men to be Moshiach, only one Moshiach Ben David can be. And if, if, if only one of them can be, then if, if there's, let's say there's 12. I know it's not 12 for the exact number, but let's say whatever the exact number is, hypothetically, we would say 12. If that's the case, then 11 of them are wrong. Does that make all the believers that that man was Moshiach all non-Jews because of it? Of course not. They're still Jewish. We, we may have a different opinion. It's like, for example, in, in, in Judaism today, we have uh, Hasidic, we have uh, Orthodox, we have uh, Chabad Lebovich, we have 
contemporary. We have uh, all, all types of sects of Judaism, but we basically have the same foundation. We all believe that Moses was our prophet and he gave the Torah, but we even have Jews out there today claiming to be Jews that don't even believe that the, that, that, that the children of Israel crossed through the Exodus. So, I mean, it's nonsense. Uh, but does it make them not Jews? No, they're Jews because they were born Jews. Okay, and of course, when we say the word Jews from the tribe of Judah, I, I realize that, you know, the lost tribes of Israel, you know, really and truly were Ephraimites, Benjamites, you know, etc. I understand that. It's, it's, it's an acronym. I have people that, that make that comment to me, you know, I'm, I'm not doing that right. So I do understand that, okay, just so you are aware of that as well. But, all right, so let's take a look at this here. Um, the genealogy of Jesus. Now, Rabbi Yosef, he points out that, for one, when Mary comes to her husband, Joseph, and he brings out the engagement laws before the hoopah. And, and I agree, he's right. In, in, in the Bible, if you were engaged, you were married. And the Christian Bible does bring that out as well. If you'll notice, when the Christian Bible writes uh, to Mary, or, to, or writes about where the angel comes to Joseph, he says to Joseph, fear not to take into the... They were espoused, but they're 99% married, as Yosef pointed out as well. And, uh, and, and, and Yosef, my brother, uh, Yosef Misachi, my brother, if you watch this video, please understand, for me, it is a search for truth. I do not mean it in any disregard to my, any of my brethren, not to you as, especially, and I don't do this to pick on you either. Uh, I know that I've been offered to be able to speak to you, uh, and I, would, I do honor that, and, and I do hope to be able to do so in the very near future. But I would like to also point out, though, my brother, that um, this is for a genuine search for truth, not just for fault. I want to search for truth. So the question comes up uh, that, that, you, that you bring out, my brother, is, is, is in regards to the genealogy of Jesus and how could that be. Now, I like the point that you bring out that you got to first get past the fact of uh, the genealogy, because in Matthew and Luke, they both record two separate genealogies for Jesus. And in, in what you bring out from, from the time of Matthew records it, they all come down from Abraham to David, pretty much the same, but from David on down, the genealogies have totally different names. And one thing I might mention too, is that I do hear often where rabbinical uh, scholars and teachers will refer to the Vatican as a source for Christianity. My brethren, that is the worst example you can give for a source. No wonder why you say that the followers today are much further away than what they were in the time of Jesus. You have to understand that John, who was the Jewish writer in the book of Revelation, speaks of the Vatican. He speaks of the Catholic Church and calls it a whore. Uh, so yes, uh, a whore, as we know, is a woman who's untrue to her marriage vow. And uh, the Christians believe that they are going to be married to Mashiach, uh, to Jesus, in, 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 a, in a marriage celebration. So therefore, that they, as, as we see Hashem, is married to Israel. I do not believe in a two-bride doctrine either. Believe me, I don't. So, and I don't believe, by the way, to uh, my, my brother Yosef, I don't, we'll get into this later as well. I don't believe in two gods either, or three gods. I believe in one God. And I believe that, uh, that Yeshua, the Moshiach, would be, uh, would be Hashem, just like it was when, when, when Hashem came to, to Abraham, he came in a human body and spoke with him. The, the, the body we called was an angel. It was Elohim. Uh, it's just the form in which God has, has presented itself to Moses. But anyway, let's get into the, to the concept, though, of who... Um, why the difference in genealogies? Why does uh, Joseph, uh, excuse me, why does uh, Matthew and Luke offer two different genealogies? Now, I'm going to read to you a little bit here. Um, this is from a very good friend of mine, Chuck Missler. He is a, a, a tremendous scholar. And I, I happen to know the answers that he gives right here, but I'm going to bring this out because it kind of sets a little platform here of the way I'm going to answer because there's something that uh, Chuck, uh, and he may know this, but he didn't write it here, but there's something that he left out as well that's very critical in knowing the answer to this. But he says right here, every Christmas season our thoughts turn to the birth of uh, Christ and to his mother Mary. 
to some extent, we all take uh, the nativity uh, for granted, but why was Jesus born of a virgin? One answer, of course, is to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 7:14: Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Um, <laughs> that brings another interesting thought. I know uh, Rabbi Yosef brings out Alma. Uh, why, do we, why do Christians translate the word Alma, a virgin, as a young maiden? You know, I happen to agree with Rabbi Yosef on that. I happen to know that. There's no, no problem with that. But I would challenge this right here. I realize Alma is a young, you know, he's speaking of a young woman. But you have to ask yourself the question here. Why would Yeshayahu, why would Isaiah make a statement that a young woman would have a child and shall call his name Emmanuel? It's, you know, for, for Isaiah to make this comment is prophetic. So it is more so the reason why in Christianity, uh, and maybe I'm speaking kind of out of, out of line, I haven't really looked at what the scholars' opinions are, but I would assume that they translate it this way because after the fact, you know that is there, there's something unique about Isaiah's uh, uh, prophecy. If a young woman is going to have a child and she's going to name it Emmanuel, well, how many women, young women had children and how many of them may have named their child Emmanuel? You know, many of them may have done this. Did that fulfill prophecy? So there had to be something unique and different about Yeshayahu's prophecy as a Navi to, to be unique. He didn't say it just for no reason. So therefore, Alma is translated as a virgin because of the uniqueness of it. Now, of course, in Judaism, we're going to look at this from a critical standpoint. We're not going to say that it's a virgin. We're going to say that she was doing something she shouldn't have been doing and trying to cover her back. Uh, to keep from being stoned for what she did. But, nonetheless, Alma, it would, it would stand to reason that it should be translated a virgin because we know what actually happened. Uh, but anyway, let me just kind of go through this. So, uh, Chuck makes this comment here. says, but that, that's more uh, descriptive than casual. Why was, uh, was it necessary in the first place? There are, of course, many profound theological issues inherent in the virgin birth, one way of you, uh, this issue is to address one of the problems it solves. Um, the problem, God announced very early that his plan for redemption involved a Messiah being brought forth from the tribe of Judah and specifically from the line of David. The succession of subsequent kings proved to be, with uh, only a few exceptions, a dismal chain as the succeeding kings of Judah went from bad to worse. We eventually encounter Jeremiah, uh, also known, uh, excuse me, not Jeremiah, Jehokaniah, also known as Jehokan, uh, Jeho I've read the seed in Hebrew, I could read it. <laughs> uh, Jehokan Chin, uh, upon whom uh, God pronounces a blood curse. Now notice that, Je Jehokaniah, and this is for the Christian people that are trying to watch the video, and, and this is something I'm aware of as well. God does pronounce that curse in there, which curses that lineage there, which, which is going to answer why uh, there's, there's a difference in here. Um, but anyway, there's a blood curse, and, and that blood curse can be found in the book of Jeremiah 22, chapter 22, verse 30. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Write ye the, uh, this man childless is a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Uh, which is Jeremiah 22, 30. So therefore, if we're looking at the son of David, if we believe it's going to come through Solomon, which it was supposed to come through Solomon, Moshiach, how could Moshiach then come through David, through his son, if it's going to come natural when there's a curse in there to begin with? So we have a problem already. Now that creates the first problem in, in the whole scenario here. Chuck goes on to say, though, this curse created a rather grim and perplexing paradox. The Messiah had to come from the royal line, yet now there was a blood curse on that very line of descent. I always visualize a celebration in the councils of Satan on that day, but then I imagine God turning to his angels saying, watch this one. I kind of like the way Chuck brings things out here. The solution. Now we have a solution here. The answer emerges in different, different uh, genealogies of Jesus recorded in the Gospels of Matthew as Levi focuses his gospel on the messiahship of Jesus and presents him as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Thus, Matthew traces the legal line from Abraham, as many Jews would, and that is true, many Jews would do it that way, through David, then through Solomon, the royal line. 
to Joseph, the legal father of Jesus, which would be an adopted father in this case here, uh, the way he did it. On the other hand, Luke as a physician focuses on the humanity of Jesus and presents him as the son of man. Luke traces the bloodline from Adam, the first man, uh, through to David and his genealogy from Abraham through David uh, is identical to Matthew's, but then after David, Luke departs from the path taken by Matthew and traces the family tree through another son of David, the second surviving son of Bathsheba, Nathan, down through Heli, the father of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And of course, this is where Chuck takes the debate here uh, that you could go, you could look it up, Chuck Missler, to kind of see where he leans on this uh, himself. Now, the, 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 the thing is, Chuck is right in the analogy. So, to take, to bring Moshiach, even for Jews, to bring Moshiach through the son of David, through Solomon, which is the way it was supposed to come according to the word of God that was written down to the prophets of the Torah and the Tanakh. Um, we have a problem because we do have a curse in there. And, and as I just read to you, so you could not have that seed. So then Luke takes it, as, as Chuck points out, as a physician, takes it down through Mary's genealogy. Now, I know Rabbi Yosef brings in the argument then, why doesn't it say the daughter of, the daughter of, the daughter of? It can't be the daughter of because it's going to go to her father and then follow through the father's line back up to Nathan. Now, Joseph, though, is interjected in there. And if you'll notice, Luke does say the supposed father of Jesus. So therefore, he's, he stands in the place as the adopted part, still showing the line of David, regardless no matter which way you get it. But here's the fascinating point, though, that I wanted to bring out to my Jewish brethren. It has to come through Mary's genealogy, the son of David. Moshiach ben David must come through a woman's genealogy and not through a man. Now, uh, I want to bring something to your attention, though. You might argue that it couldn't come through a woman to begin with. Well, in, in the book of Numbers, in Levitical law, God make, pro, made provision that it could be this way. And I just want to read to you in chapter 27, for those that follow in English here. Then came the daughters of... Um, uh, Zelopochad, uh, Zelopochad, the son of, uh, gosh, I'm not used to these names in English, uh, Hephel, the son of Gilead, the son of Machia, the son of Manasseh, from the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. These were the names of the daughters of Mahala, Noach, Haggai, Machai, and Terzah. And they stood before Moses, before Eleazar the priest, and before the leaders, and all the congregation by the doorway of the tabernacle and the meeting, saying, Our father died in the wilderness, but he was not of the company of those who gathered together against Hashem and the company with Korah. But he died in his own sin, and he had no sons. Why should the name of our father be removed from among his family because he had no sons? Give us a possession among our father's brothers. So Moses brought their case before Hashem, and Hashem spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zilopohed speak what is right. You shall surely give them a possession of the inheritance among their father's brothers and cause the inheritance of their father to pass to them. And you shall speak in the children of Israel, saying, If a man dies and has no son, then you shall cause his inheritance to pass to his daughter. Now, that's the law of Moses, so it can be that way. But more importantly, now we can establish then that, that, the, that, the, that the birthright can come through the father. Now, as Chuck pointed out, though, Matthew brings it up through what we would call maybe the legal line, the legal line of, uh, of, of David, which would have been through Solomon, which was the way we would have thought that it would have came. But in reality, the scripture, we can go back to Barashit and see in Genesis that God never intended Moshiach ben David, yes, the son of David, but the son of David is still a grandson. So it doesn't matter if he's on the mother's side or the father's side. And so therefore, when we look at Moshiach ben David, um, it could easily be Mary's son as well. And, uh, and, and so therefore, I want to read to you from Genesis and... Let's move on down here to verse, uh, to verse um, um, OK, 
Okay, let's go to, I think, verse 9. Then, the, then Hashem, uh, the Lord God, called to Adam and said to him, okay, this is where Hashem is looking for his children. Okay, now let's move a little further down here. Um, okay, well, let's start with verse 12. The man said, The woman whom you have gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And Hashem... The Lord uh, God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And she shall, and excuse me, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Hashem clearly shows us that the seed would come through the woman. It comes through Eve right here. But the question is, is what seed is God speaking of here when he's talking to Adam and Eve? The, the, the whole fall of the human race, the whole fall that took place in the Garden of Eden is there's something that Adam and Eve had that we don't have today. And we have to go back for redemption to see, for Gula, we have to see what happened in Genesis to understand. It's not just the fact of the genealogy. The genealogy is majorly important. It's not there's a contradiction. One takes it to show you that the genealogy through Joseph, even though he is not a literal son, comes uh, through David. He is a son of David. He actually loops it both ways and through his mother. But it has to come through the mother because God tells the serpent that, 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 that he would, there would be hatred between his seed and the woman's seed. And the woman's seed is Moshiach ben David. It is a prophetic utterance that Moshiach would come, but the Moshiach is going to come through the woman. Now, think about this, brethren, really carefully as we look into this. And we may have to cut this video right here. I, I, I'm seeing already that we're already a half hour into this. But I'm going to try to do it. I don't know how long my, my YouTube will allow me to publish this video. So if we have a space here, go to part two. But if not, if it keeps going, praise, praise the Lord. Let's continue on. Now, when Eve, when God says to Eve that, or to the serpent, he's going to put hatred between the woman's seed and the serpent's seed, then that means the woman would have a seed. Now, and that seed is to be Moshiach ben David. It is to be the Messiah. It is a prophecy speaking that he would come. And it also is prophetic letting us know that the serpent's seed would bruise the heel of the Messiah, but the Messiah would bruise the serpent's head. And we see this with, with Moses lifting up the brass serpent in the wilderness as a type showing what's going to happen. Now, pardon me just for a second here. I want to bring, though, to your attention something that's very critical right here, my brethren. The reason why the woman has to have the seed and the reason why this genealogy must come through Mary and not through Yosef is because of what happens in Genesis. Eve doubted the word of God. She disbelieved what God told her. And because of the unbelief, the disbelief, the, or the deception that came, it caused Adam and Eve to lose what God had given them, which in my opinion was the very life of Hashem. Hashem was living in them. Now, now think of this, my brethren, because we know that it says in the Hebrew language, when God was making Adam, you know, he was like a, he was a, you know, he made him a, a ish. We know that uh, the, the rabbinical, uh, the blessed rabbis point out that the word ish and isha, which is for man and for woman. It comes from the two words, ish, which be fire, and of course, the, uh, and in the middle of the word ish is the yod for the, for the, for the man, uh, aleph yod shin, which represents the first letter of the divine name of God. And then, of course, isha, when she's taken from man, we have aleph shin he, in which the last letter in her name is the second letter to, to create the word, the divine, uh, first part of the divine name, which you would have yah, which we would translate as God. Now, 
the, the rabbis noticed that the word uh, uh, Eish being the fire is a, is a representative actually of the Spirit of God because when Moses met Hashem at the burning bush, Elohim, and the reason why it speaks of the angel coming down and, uh, and calls him Elohim, it is the attribute of God. And from the midst of the fire, right in the midst, Aleph and the Sheen, right in the midst of the Eish, spoke right through the middle, spoke Hashem. The divine name, the Yod. This is why the Yod is in there. It is, uh, it is letting us know that what was inside of Adam was it was the spirit of Almighty God. No wonder why the, the Torah reads, the Nevesh Chaya, you know, or excuse me, I'm sorry, we got this backwards here, the uh, Nevesh Chayim, for the soul, literally for the soul, is the life of God. He breathed in his nostrils, he became a living soul, but it actually says, la nefesh, for the soul, la nefesh, chayim. And the chayim is the life and it's in plural form. You know that, my brethren, you know that. It is in plural form. And that chayim is God's life in plural form. And he puts this in Adam. When he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, he puts that life in him. And then we read that he takes from the side of Adam, he puts him into a deep sleep, and he takes from his side, you know, it doesn't say rib, we know that, it doesn't say rib, it says he takes from his side, and from the man, from the ish, he made the woman. The from the man part, from the ish, is showing that from that chayim that was in him, he creates his helpmate. Now, we realize there's a DNA as well involved there from taking from the side. We don't know what part of the side. Some of the rabbis, uh, the blessed rabbis, speculate that it was half of Adam was taken and created Eve. There's a good possibility because if you think about the split rock out in the desert, God split the rock and the waters of life came from there. And we know that Hashem, the Almighty God, is represented there as that water of life. And the rock being split is a representation that Adam was split and parted, and the life that was in him, the life of Hashem, came upon and he created, from that half he created Eve. Now the problem is, is after the creation, then the fall comes. So what is lost? What is lost? Something had to have been lost and it should be evident to us because what do we find? Adam takes, and when the fall comes, Adam begins to, uh, uh, in this case here, uh, the Bible says, God, uh, God uh, says to Eve, your desire shall be to your husband and, 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 uh, and you shall look up to him. Well, her desire must have not have been to, to Adam to start with. You know? So let me just read that to you real quick. Uh, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm so excited, I kind of get next to myself in reading this. Uh, between your seed and the, the woman, he says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception, and, and in pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Sorry, I, did, I had that a little bit worded wrong in English there. And he shall rule over you. So it, it tells us there, my brethren, that God did not institute rulership. He couldn't have. Because the fall is what brought rulership, not as a divine institute of God, but God showing Eve the consequences of the fall. One, he says that, uh, he says right here, um, let me read it again, your desire shall be for your husband. Well, her desire must have been to Hashem to start with then. And it would be obvious if God has placed the Spirit of God inside of Eve, in the spirit of God inside of Adam, then she was looking to God all the time. Although that she, was, she had a husband and she loved him, and God had said that they would uh, repopulate the earth, that is true. Bring forth children. And the bringing forth the children never stopped. But what did change was the fact that her husband was going to rule over her, and her desire would no longer be to, to, to Hashem, but it would be to her husband now. Why? He's the source of strength for her now. And he is bigger, so he's going to rule over her because of, the, because of what happened in the fall. Now, here's... It's really interesting, my brother. You have to bear with me. You know, I know when I listen to Rabbi Yosef, he, he really takes a long time to bring out his question on this. Uh, 
And so I do ask you to bear with me in this, re in this regard here because we were looking at the genealogy of Jesus to begin with and, and I can show you that you know, there was a curse that came down through Solomon's line, through David. And so it had to be brought down through Mary. Now, the thing is, is the fall came from disbelief in the, in, in the word of God. And Adam also did the same thing. And so they lost the spirit of God. So Gula, redemption, has to bring us back to what it was in the Garden of Eden before the fall. We as Jews were raised up as a priestly nation. God found favor with Abraham. We were raised up as a priestly nation for what? To offer sacrifices to Hashem. To give back sacrifice to God. But there's a reason for the sacrifice. And the sacrifice is to make atonement for the sins. But the sacrifice of the animals, when the animals were sacrificed, when the lamb was put on the, uh, on the altar once a year for the sins of Israel and was sacrificed, the life left the lamb, but the life could not come back upon us as Jews to be able to redeem us back to Hashem. This is what Moshiach was to be, what was to be born for. Now, Rabbi uh, Yosef, and not just brother, my brother here, I don't want to pick on Rabbi Yosef. He points out that, you know, we know that the, when Mashiach comes, there's supposed to be peace and all of this. But my brother, don't forget, it's written in the Talmud by the blessed rabbis that Mashiach was to die before the destruction of the second temple. But, but it didn't happen. At least in our opinion, it didn't happen. But it did happen. And, and, of course, the, the rabbis get it from Daniel. Daniel says that, uh, that, uh, that the Messiah would be cut off in the midst of the week. And, 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 and of course, it says in there where, where it speaks, uh, speaks where it's speaking of Titus, that, that, you know, that, uh, that the princess shall come, shall be of the people that come and destroy the temple and the sanctuary. So we knew the temple and the sanctuary had to be destroyed. The rabbis recognized that from Daniel's writing, the temple had to be destroyed, and the Mashiach would come and die before that, because it said he'd be cut off, so they assumed that he would die. So we have to have a two-part, and it's funny. It's funny, because when, when Jesus reads in Yeshayahu, Shishim Be'echad, or Isaiah 61, we see that uh, Yeshua reads verse 1 and half of verse 2 to bring the acceptable year, etc. But he doesn't read the rest of it that applies to Mashiach, which is to bring judgment. So even Jesus knew that he was to be cut off, as Daniel said, and his ministry would, would pick up somewhere down the road. You know, Hosea knew that our people would be scattered. Hosea knew and, uh, that in the fifth chapter that our people would be scattered and we'd be regathered on the third day. 2,700 and some odd years since that prophecy that Hosea said. And Hosea even said that in our affliction, we would seek him earnestly. Now, I have to challenge my Jewish brethren. In the history of Judaism, you know, when Israel, we were as a nation at one time before the, the fall, as a people of God, as a chosen people, the only time we were ever scattered from our homeland was because of sin. The house of Israel was scattered in around 723 BCE. And it was for sin and idolatry, as, as, as God has said to us, that we were scattered for. And, but Judah also was scattered in 70 AD. We were, we were taken into Babylon, into captivity. Why? Because of sin. The scripture bears that the righteous went with the wicked because of sin. And yet we scratch our heads and wonder why did our people get scattered at 70 AD? It had to be because of sin. Now we were not there, but it had to be because of sin. The question is, is what connection then, if, if any you might say as a Jew, what connection if any did Jesus of Nazareth have to do with the, with the, with the destruction of the temple of 70 AD? And the dispersion of Israel, Israel scattered all the world. Now we do know that the prophecy said that we would be gathered again. But we had to have done something wrong before the, before the destruction of the temple and for our people to be scattered. Hashem is not going to scatter us for no reason. But he did promise 
that when we would be regathered this time, we would not be scattered again. And, and by the way, just something that comes to me, I want to say it while I'm thinking about it here. Um, when the rabbi said that Jesus never prophesied that Israel would return, the Lord's Prayer, as it's fame, fame called, Jesus makes this comment. He says, Our Father who art in heaven, they ask him, How do we pray? He said, Pray like this Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That is a prophecy. And you might say, how could that be a prophecy? Jesus is telling his disciples at the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Sanctify your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Now how in God's name is... For one, how, how, he's telling them to pray that God would sanctify his name. So you say, well, how could that be a prophecy? It's a prophecy. Let me real quick just turn to that real quick. I believe it's uh, Jeremiah. Maybe it's Ezekiel. But let me just turn real quick and let me see if I can find it for you. Uh, no, it is, it is Ezekiel. It's in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 36. And I'm just going to read just a little bit of this for you real quick. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations, whether they went. Therefore, say to the house of Israel. Now, this is not this is not the house of Judah. This is not 70 A.D. This is this is 723 years before the house of Judah is, is, is scattered. I will sanctify my great name. Oh my gosh! Jesus said, "Pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Sanctify Thy name." How's it? So, if He's telling the, His disciples to pray that God would sanctify His name. What is he praying for then? There's a, there's a specific reason for the prayer. Let's look at that real quick. Uh, Sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am Hashem, the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. So he will, his, in other words, his name will be hallowed or sanctified in their eyes. When? We're going to find out when. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of the countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. That prophecy, and Jews know as well as I do, that that prophecy of, uh, of Ezekiel right there in chapter 36, verse, well, it's actually the whole chapter really, but uh, especially right in there around verse 23 there, is the return of the house of Israel, the lost tribes of Israel, to the homeland. And you say Jesus never prophesied, but said to the contrary, prophesied that Israel would not return as a nation. Jesus' own prayer instructs his disciples to pray that God's name would be sanctified, and he's speaking of the prophecy of Ezekiel that the only way the name of God would be sanctified was to bring the lost house of Israel home. He's telling them, instructing them to pray that the house of Israel would return. So he does prophesy of it. And let's get back to the, let's get back to the point here, though. I want to go back to Gula, to the redemption. Eve, we see, forfeited the word of God. The seed, according to Hashem, is going to come to the woman. But not necessarily Eve. Did you ever notice, my brethren, my red wrinkle brethren, one thing, one thing I want to point out to you. Is, is, these are things that are very important. And I know it's lengthy, but it's important that we understand this. Did you ever notice nowhere in the Torah did Moses say that Hashem had to breathe the breath of Chaim into Eve? Why? When, when God taken from Ish, he said he took from the man Ish. You know it's written in Hebrew that way. He took from Ish. And he made Isha. That's why when we read in Adam, he breathes in his nostrils,